Ladies and gentlemen, the National Arena League is heating up. Two epic games have concluded. Six phenomenal teams compete, but only four this week. Let's start with the Idaho Horsemen traveling all the way across the country for a rematch with the Carolina Colts. But quarterback Austin Schaefer doesn't make the trip. Devon Blair Jr., who started his arena career as a receiver, takes over a quarterback with only two days of practice. First drive, he throws deep looking for Ryan Stokes, but it's just out of his reach. Cobras take over. They're in the red zone. Myers finds Kendrick Eames, who bounces off a tackle and won't go down until he's in the end zone. Cobra's up early. Next horseman possession. The pass is tipped by Caleb Lowry and intercepted by Cam Ellis, who refuses to go down. It was called a score, but a block in the back penalty brought the offense back on the field. Result? On fourth down, Myers, like a true Cobra, has eyes in the side of his head and bullets a pass to Summers for a first down. What a play. On the next fourth down, however, Brennan Dunn gets the shoelace tackle and the horsemen have the ball. But they wouldn't hold on to it. Cobras, early second quarter. It's Myers on the keeper. Sheds a tackle and dives, just crossing the plane before contact. Next horseman possession. A third down throw shows the new QB and receivers haven't had time to get on the same page. Idaho does drive the length of the field, though, and finally gets a touch. Oh, it's incomplete as Jamari Milliken gets his right fingertip on the potential score and the Cobras would take over again. Myers has another keeper and another touchdown. Idaho trying to score before half and Blair goes deep but is picked off by Joe Powell who dances around in his beautiful dreads, making moves like he's returning kicks for the St. Louis Battle Hawks and the Cobras attempt a field goal at the end of the half and Rashad Flanders attempts a return off the net, but C.J. Kane says, not in my house. He looks like the Hulk slamming Loki. Puny God. Second half. Myers throws to Milton Williams out of the slot, who dives into the end zone for his second touchdown of the year. The Cobra's route is on. Chris Reynolds draws up a cool play with his motion receivers going to the same side as the others, creating a convoy of blockers and an 11-yard run for Blair. Awesome play, but another horseman red zone trip ends in another turnover on downs. Next possession, Myers does a touch pass, and Williams high points it, getting both feet down in the back of the end zone. 35 zip. Cobras. Wow. Another fourth down for the Horsemen. Another turnover on downs by Carolina's defense. Brandon Negron says, what haven't we done yet? Guy, go deep to Eames. And Myers drops a beautiful rainbow and a great catch by Kendrick Eames for the touchdown. Just look at that throw and catch. Culver is doing everything right. Rashad Flanders on the return, doing everything he can to help the team. He had an interception for the Horseman earlier, and his great return sets up the team for this. Blair bobbles the snap, steps up in the pocket, and throws a strike to Kyler Henson. Rashad Flanders won't give up as he intercepts another ball, setting up great field position for the Horseman around the one-minute mark. Another throw to Kyler Henson, who is called down, but I don't believe his knee, elbow, or buttocks ever hit the turf. He's robbed of a touchdown. They call the game as Carolina delivers an absolute beatdown. 42-6, should have been 42-12, but the Horsemen sit at 0-2 and travel to Omaha next week while Carolina improves to 2-1. and In a little bit of a tighter match, we go to Omaha. Opening kickoff, the Spartans are looking to make a statement with Steven Newbold showing the moves and taking it for a house call. We are Sparta delivered right out of the gate and that's a way to quiet the cowbells at the start. Beef first possession, it's Tommy Armstrong on the read option, takes it up the gut with authority and says, get off me. Beef Tutty, you heard? 7-6 Omaha. Spartans next possession, the Beef bring the heat with Daryl Pointer. Tells Jason Whitaker, look at this nice new turf. View it up close. Turnover on downs on the big sack. On third and nine, Armstrong goes deep and is just out of the diving reach of that cool moose fellow. 
Paul Moose, I think I'm getting closer to pronouncing his name, will stay tuned for their deep ball later. For now, it's Spartans ball. Jason Whitaker continues his campaign for King of the Shovel Pass as Campbell bolts for six and a Spartans lead. Late in the second, Armstrong keeps the read option and hurdles high for the first down. It's football, Tommy, not track. But track looks good on you and makes for great football. He says, my legs are tired, but my arm is strong. Armstrong with a bullet to that cool moose fellow. Beef back on top. Spartans, however, are not deterred. Third and 11, it's Whitaker to Newbolt, first down. Then Whitaker to Campbell, who gets more chunk yards and another first down. Last play of the first half, rolls out of the pocket and a bullet's a tutty to Steve Newbold, giving the Spartans a 19-13 lead at halftime. Second half gets even more entertaining. It's Whitaker to Kadarius Campbell again, and the Spartans are up two scores in the second half in Omaha. We are Sparta! Beef offense gets Tobias Taylor involved. Later that drive, Armstrong flexes his deep ball and Jordan Barton makes the adjustment for a beef tutty. Back to a one score game. Start of the fourth quarter. It's a fumble and Rodell Rahman gets a beef safety, igniting the crowd and getting some tie night love. Tommy Armstrong's strong arm isn't done as he goes deep and drops a dime into the bread basket of Cool Moose. Cool Moose with the tutty, giving the beef back the lead. But them Colorado Spartans aren't done. Whitaker says, I have a strong arm too, Armstrong. He drops a tutty in the arms of Deontay Rariak. I probably completely butchered his name, but he butchered this headstand so I feel a little justified. Regardless, the Deontay fella put the resilient Spartans back on top. Beef game plan? Feed Tobias. The pitch to Tobias gives them six. His run up the gut gives them two more. 37-32 beef in an electric game. Would Colorado take the lead again? Whitaker throws and Steve Newbold one-handed. Oh, it's up in the air and it's picked by Trey Dudley Giles who could go all the way. Touchdown beef, and the crowd goes bonkers, and Matt Patton goes full on Matt Passion. Don't miss his show Prime Cuts with the Omaha Beef because he'll love talking about this victory as the Beef win it 45-32 and improve to 2-0 on the season while Colorado officially falls to 0-1. Next, let's take a quick peek at the standings. The Omaha Beef sit atop the standings with the Sioux City Bandits being the only other undefeated team. There are three winless teams in league play so far, but that could change very quickly. Austin Schaefer didn't make the Carolina trip, so didn't get demoted in his passing yard average. Jason Whitaker joins the ranks. Guy Myers has 10 pass TDs in three games, Tommy Armstrong with five and two. In the run game, Armstrong leads with 136 yards, followed by Myers with 91 and Tobias Taylor at 73. In the receiving game, Adam Smith has the most yards in two games, followed by Kirill Colmus, who had 99 last week. Receiving TDs is all Cobra's receivers. Smith, Milton Williams, and Kendrick Ings all have three apiece. On defense, Kevin Simmons still leads in tackles, followed by teammate Gibson Zaya and Brennan Dunn gets in the mix with 11. The Sacks leaders may reveal why the beef are at the top of the standings. These guys can get to the quarterback, with all top Sacks leaders being on Omaha. Interceptions are led by Trey Dudley Giles and an Idaho Horseman wide receiver? Rashad Flanders can do it all. Kick returns for touchdowns has Adam Smith at two, while Stephen Newbold of Colorado joins Fred Bruno at one apiece. But returns and yards has Adam Smith at 245 yards, and followed by Rashad Flanders with 168. And another Rashad, Mr. Ridley of Oklahoma, has 94 in just one game. The undisputed kicker is Kevin DiDio Weber, who in three full games still hasn't missed a PAT. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today I have a couple of very special guests on the show. We have a rematch from week one. The Oklahoma Flying Aces are going back to Sioux City to take on the Bandits for a rematch. Today I've got Richard Davis, the head coach of the Oklahoma Flying Aces and 
his enemy, Irv Strobean of the Sioux City Bandits. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us, Nico. First of all, and I got to get this one out of the way, Irv Strobean, congrats, brother. A hundred wins. That's incredible that very few coaches ever reach that achievement. Well, I appreciate that. Um, um means a lot to come to work every day with guys that uh, I consider my brothers and uh, none of that happens without them. I'm just a, I'm just a guy that goes on the stat sheet, to be honest with you. So, um, but appreciate all your coverage of it. And, uh, um, it, it is pretty cool for the, for the organization. That is really cool. And if you get another win this weekend and you have 101 wins, then we need to start a new show called winning football 101 with Irv Stroby. Well, hopefully uh, we don't get stuck on 101 then. No. Dukon, I, I, do, I do think you should know, Dukon, that on his fancy plaque that he gets for his 100th win, there is some some small print, fine print down at the bottom that said, how impressive is it really when 75 of those wins are against one guy, meaning Richard Davis? I mean, come on. <laughs> it's not, not impressive. <laughs> totally not true. Fine, I gotta see this thing now <laughs> well Irv after this 100th win d- does it add to your pressure to perform as a coach no I'll be honest with you the pressure was last year when uh should have happened five games prior we started out five and one last year if you remember and then yes. the wheels fell off could not correct it so you know we just uh we couldn't we couldn't get the ship righted last year you know we started out great in first place and then uh you know uh, the the whole train derailed, unfortunately. So to be honest with you, I, it's not even a stat that I was tracking had I not had Brett who's setting up the camera and, you know, yeah. keeping track of this and Coach Loeb <laughs> you know, big, big believer and, you know, uh, letting the guys know how good the organization is. And I, I mean, I, it's something that I just try to go to work every day. And had Loeb not told me a couple of years ago that this was even a, a milestone I could hit, I would have never paid attention to it. In my opinion, we go back to work. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, not the ultimate goal is to get me and my name uh, 100 wins it's a great um uh, i guess side benefit to you know being in the playoffs every year and making championship runs but the ultimate goal is for for us to win a, a championship together well that's awesome and i i gotta say that the sioux city bandits are currently at 188 franchise wins they're 12 away from 200 which is incredible that's that's unheard of coach davis not a lot of NAL fans are aware of this, but the NAL has now two head coaches that are also owners of the team. One of them is Chris Reynolds of the Idaho Horseman. The other is yourself. I've always wondered, what is that like to be the head coach of a team that you also own? And how do you balance your time between football and business? Well, I mean, I guess I can I can share with you some breaking news, or not breaking necessarily news, but some new news to the world that I am no longer uh, the owner, Duke oh, Um Okay. We have um, secured a new owner. He's going to do a great job. He's an Oklahoma-based business uh, guy. He's come on board. We've got full league approval and all those kind of good things. But he's kind of one of those guys that he doesn't want to race out. You know, he doesn't need the publicity either. So we have made that uh, transition. And and it is for the, the betterment of the not only our franchise, but also for the league. Joey's going to be a great owner. He's going to be a, a very positive addition to our league. In a roundabout way, he helps answer the question that you just asked, which is, to be honest with you, Duke, on it's very, very difficult to do all everything, um, more so than I probably could describe to you, because as Irv will tell you, whereas Irv is not necessarily an owner of that team, Irv is a absolutely integral part in the front office, just quietly. He doesn't tell you that, but he sells and he goes out and does all those things. And and those of us who are asked to do both of the front office and the coaching uh, side of this, it can be a lot, Dukon. It can. It can. There's no um, no sugarcoating it. There's times where it can take away, one side can take away from the other. So for me, being able to deliver this franchise in the good owner will take it vastly further than I can in a pro- productive way, uh, which allows me now to offload that and get back to bo- coaching ball. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but but over the course of time, we're proud of some of the things we did, you know, but it is it is a lot, man. It's 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 too much. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. Don't focus on the coaching side, at least this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go back to business, Coach Davis. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> go That's sell right. tickets. Don't game plan. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Davis, last time you had quarterbacks, um, a ditch last second and had to have a receiver play quarterback also because of the league 
removing two teams from the schedule, the schedule gods gave you a shortened training camp with very limited practice. When you go back to Sioux City this week, why will this time be different than week one? Well, I mean, simple, players. Um, it's, it's, you know, I've, I think we've got time now that we were able to give them, invest in them in terms of preparation. We ask a lot of them. I am very proud of the men that I've put together uh, here. When I ask them to be able to accept the challenge to play on three days notice, their competitors, they, they, you know, they've got careers to manage. Um, and they didn't want to get put in a position that was um, an, an unwinnable you know, situation. Sure. But when you explain it to them as a whole, how it happened, why it happened, and and how we were part of the the solution for the league's problem at the moment, they stepped up and, and accepted that and never held it against us and said, hey, let's go roll up our sleeves and go try to beat these guys. I was proud of them, Dukon. I mean, I, I said it to you privately, and and Irv and I have talked about it. Uh, you know, Irv and I, uh, Marlon, his D coordinator, his heck, his old office coordinator, JD. I'm I'm very close friends with those guys. I. Irv, is, Irv and I talk all the time. They saw it in, in our guys, too, that we we fought. We hung in there. Mm -hmm. We just weren't ready, you know, and so we sure. just didn't have enough time. Situations, as an example, that we were we found ourselves in, we were winging it. And then when you throw in Torrance, who was accepted that challenge as a quarterback, and I, I might add that Torrance, Torrance did a heck of a job, man. I'm proud of him, but it didn't surprise me, Dukon. I, I, I knew he was going to step up and do what he did. I hate moral victories. But we had one in the in the sense that okay, hey, you know what? We survived. We we didn't just get annihilated. Now let's go back to the drawing board. Let's try to get ourselves the time that we need to prepare. Um, we've made some personnel changes, and so I'm going back up there with what I think are better players. I'm still the same, sorry coach, but I've got better players. And I'll be honest with you, that's how this business works. It's sure. not coaching. It's, it's who you put out on that field and if they can get their job done. Excellent response. So I'm going to go back to you, Coach Strobing. How do you convince your guys that with the personnel changes and more time for the Aces to practice, that this is not the same Oklahoma Flying Aces team coming back into town? Well, I think I made them fully aware of that at halftime of last week when I said this team has had three practices and are taking you guys, you know, to the to the wire. And I told them that after, I mean, he, Coach Davis put together a great team and I commend those guys and coming up here. I'm, I'm glad they, they, they played as well as they did um, because it gave us a great measuring stick to think, Hey, we really got to turn things up around here. You know, I've got a lot of new guys, you know, we're a little bit of, of uh, raw, fresh meat to add some positions. We also have some good experience out there and I need that good experience to start leading some of these rookies, but I also need to make sure that uh, these rookies are the one that's going to be with us the rest of the season. And, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm glad that coach Davis has had a good amount of time to practice now because it's going to be another great measuring stick for us. If, if we sure. can't get it done now, now I got to go start. We won the game and, and they took this game on a short, like, <laughs> like taking a heavyweight fight against a, you know, a fill in opponent against Mike Tyson back in the day, you know, it's like for coach Davis to come, you know, again, for the betterment of the league to, to come here on three or four days of practice. I don't know that I would have done the same thing, you know, so <laughs> it's off to him, but, um, you know, uh, again, I, I I went in at halftime and I said, you know, these guys have had three days of practice and and they're playing you like they've been together for years. It's going to be a dogfight on on Saturday night, and I think I've tried to make our guys aware of that. If not, if they if they're not aware of it at this point, then they ain't listening. <laughs> Good answer. So I just muted Coach Davis so he can't hear the next part of our conversation. Um, earlier, before you came on, he revealed to me that he goes pretty weak need for a good cheeseburger. And uh, I think that perhaps if you were to supply him with said cheeseburger before the game, that uh, he might tell the guys to take it easy on you. What do you think? I can arrange that. I appreciate the inside information. <laughs> there, there you go. That's just between I'm us. Arrange a free game meal today. So we're, we're good to go there. Then. What is your score prediction for this upcoming game? Oh, I will humor you. Um, 42, 35, Sioux City Bandits. Okay. Um, I'd like to think that both teams actually start scoring in this indoor arena football style. Nobody wants to see a defensive slugfest. You know, I, I, I love my defense guys. I, I, one of my best friends in the world is my defensive coordinator, but nobody comes to watch the defense. We got to start scoring some dang points. Coach Davis, same question. What's your score prediction for this game? Oh, man. You know, 
That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> my wife's family is all from that area. A lot of people don't know that. I'll have in-laws in the stands. The first game is an example. They leaned over and said, hey, can we get a football? And I said, sure. And I go in there over and I give my nieces and nephews, all the crew there, football. And they looked at me and said, no, we we mean it's a Sioux City Bandits football. Right? Uh. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I, I get it. Yeah, my wife is her family, all the in-laws. My brother-in-law lives literally in Sioux City. I've even got family rooting against me, man, um, or, or against us. Um, so that's a tough one. But. Um, you know, I, I really don't know about the score prediction. In my opinion, over the years, Irv and his staff have done the best job coaching that I personally have coached against. And it's because they put so much enormous pressure on you of all of the very different things that they do. And they, they've got it figured out, hence the 100 wins and all that kind of stuff. So you just don't know. Um, I would like to think we'll put some more points on the board because we do have some players, but this is going to be the first time those guys have walked out there too. And and so sure. I'm, I'm transferring rookies, first timers for rookies who got a few more practices. So if, if Irv predicts that I'll just I, find a way to get one more than him. That's it's, it's all I care about, uh, um, <laughs> how, whatever it takes. And so I guess my prediction is, I guess it's better than the alternative because my other options are, I'll just lose like I always do to the guy. So, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll find a way to, to win one this time, I hope, or we can. Our guys will save me. There we go. Great responses, guys. Really, really good responses. You've got a pair of gentlemen here. And you know what? At around the NAL, we like to do things just a little bit differently and mix things up. So we're going to have a very special treat for you this next episode coming up where both of these gentlemen, Richard Davis and Irv Strobing, have agreed to be mic'd up for the next game. And we're going to go to Sioux City and shoot a cinematic recap of this game. So I hope you'll stay tuned. We believe that both of you guys are gentlemen. And if you have a little colorful language, we'll edit it out so we can continue to believe that you are gentlemen. Thanks, guys, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Any last words? Get the edit button ready. <laughs> We're talking about me, uh, Duke, uh, not him. Uh, we all know that. But uh, <laughs> I think my last words were, uh, I want to be as congratulations, Irv. I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you, buddy. That 100 win is pretty cool. Let's just, uh, I'm going to hold off that 100 first. We're not going to, we're going to stop that thing right now. So, well, awesome. I, I appreciate it. And I know, I know you'll, uh, you'll give it your best shot. That's for sure. You know, I, whatever the chips fall, we'll, we'll shake hands at the end of it. Absolutely. Everyone, it's Coach Richard Davis of the Oklahoma Flying Aces. They're traveling to take on the Sioux City Bandits for 2.0 against Irv Strobeam. This interview had me having a tough time trying to predict a winner to this game. I hate to do it, but for the sake of entertainment, I'll say that I expect it to be a very close affair this time around, as I think both teams have improved tremendously. I expect the scoring to be up a notch with the Sioux City Bandits coming away with a close one, 47-45. Next, we have the Colorado Spartans going to Greensboro to play the Cobras. Coach Shaw has played here before and is pretty familiar with the Cobras, so I expect them to be in it the whole game. In all honesty, I think the difference in the game will be a Kevin DiDio Weber kick, whether it's a deuce or a field goal. In this case, I predict it's a field goal at the buzzer, giving the Carolina Cobras fans a great show, 54-51 final.